a range of experiences and, uh, and such a, uh, uh, an interesting approach from all these different perspectives. Uh, very, very helpful. So to summarize and try to integrate all of this, um, when, when I was originally asked to, make, to give this talk, I thought about all the different definitions of value that we get taught. And you know, they all, they're all called value. So there's valuation in the sense that many of you use it from economics, decision neuroscience, decision psychology. And that has you know, the usual expected value utility, cost benefit analysis sort of thing. Then there's values the way it's talked about in decision in um, social psychology and developmental psychology and in terms of social norms, moral principles, what's valued by an individual such as a patient but also a provider, a payer, or a system administrator. Now you can relate these two to each other. They're supposed to be related in theory. You can, for example, take moral values and plug them into a utility function. But sometimes there's something lost in that translation and I'm gonna talk about that. It's not so simple to define one in terms of the other. Although you know economists, it all can be utility, <laughs> right? So as was uh, so eloquently stated here in earlier sessions as well as in this one, the individual versus the population perspective can differ. And the question is, should the individual perspective be reduced to the population perspective or vice versa? And this is tr the tr tremendous tension that all of you I think are familiar with. Should moral values be traded off? Now we've talked about trade-offs that involve moral values, so I don't know the answers to all the questions I'm gonna ask you today, but I think that they're questions we all have to contemplate. Uh, very briefly, the theoretical uh, um, uh, framework that my colleagues and I have developed say there's really more than one way to think about these decisions, and that an individual person thinks about it in multiple ways. On the one hand, uh, very typically, people think about decision making in terms of the gist, which is a bottom line categorical, lives are saved or lost, live, die, that sort of thing, versus a kind of trading off of probability and outcomes of the sort of the classical expected utility approach or even expected value, there's evidence. And people seem to do both of those things. And the degree to which they think in terms of this bottom line qualitative gist influences whether they in fact retrieve their values and apply them to their decisions. So you can separate the application psychologically of social and moral values from the way we think, whether we trade off or not. So I think that provides some purchase on this, this problem. And today the speakers here really ranged uh, and expressed the gamut of ways of thinking about uh, the individual decision maker all the way to the societal level. And I think we have to address all of these levels, and that's sort of the bottom line message of my talk. Rather than reduce it to one perspective or another, in fact, I think we have the very hard and challenging task to not disregard any of these perspectives. So what do I mean by trading off? Well, earlier there was a question about saving the individual baby in the NICU versus giving everyone vaccinations. And that is seen as a, a trade-off between the individual and perhaps a core, core moral value uh, versus the population. Now the public, of course, worries about us doing things like that. They worry about us, you know, death panels and quality and who's gonna get thrown out of the lifeboat to save the rest of the people that are in the lifeboat. That's the stark reality of some of the public discourse on this. And public trust is an important intangible in all of this. If we lose the public trust um, for what we think are very rational reasons, in fact, humane motivations sometimes, um, that's a problem. So we know from literature, not just based on fuzzy trace theory, but other research, that equity is a core value though. Treating everybody the same, which is implicit in standardizing care. The, the core value that motivates that is everybody gets treated the same way, same problem, same treatment. Uh, implicit in presenting a distribution of spending, did we spend the same on everybody, is this core value. There's a notion, a kind of implicit assumption there that everyone should be, have the same expenditure. But think about that. We also have competing values that we also consider core. Like, suppose you have a, a, a dread disease and the only possibility of non-negligible possibility of life is an experimental treatment. There's people in this room, by the way, who are faced with that decision and some of them are our great decision scientists. And they're alive today because they made the decision for the possibility as opposed to the probability of life. So that's a very distinct value, and yet that's also represented in the brain. So 
when you think about what's more advanced, you know, we think of, and, and just about every cognitive theory has assumed that the trading off part is more advanced, the deliberative probability times outcomes, that kind of thinking is more advanced. But there's actually evidence to show that as you get older from childhood to adulthood, you engage in less of that trading off and more of that qualitative categorical gist-based thinking. So there's a uh, there's studies, for example, on framing effects that those that little kids are are objective and rational and trade off, and as you get older, framing effects actually emerge. And this is where you treat gains and losses differently, even when they're the same. People who trade off seem to have poorer health outcomes, and I'm talking about like personal risky choices. So if you measure their decision making in the lab, and then you ask them, well, you know, how often do you drive too fast or drink too much or have unprotected sex? they're more likely to do those things if they're actually trading off risk and reward than if they're thinking in a categorical way. So if you think to yourself, it only takes once to get HIV, you're less likely to get HIV, <laughs> at least by self-report. So physicians, by the way, we've studied physician decision-making, and as you go from a medical student to a generalist to a specialist to a subspecialist, for example, in cardiology, you're more and more likely to make triage decisions, for example, in, in, the, in the ER, based on simple, just categorical distinctions as opposed to trading off. And uh, so in other words, as physicians become more expert, they trade off less and less. So these are all counterintuitive. These suggest that perhaps verbatim trading off is not obviously the most advanced, cognitively superior way to, to think. Because if little kids are doing more of it and you're doing less of it as you get older, perhaps it's because something else is smarter. But I want to add, though, given all the subtle remarks that were made here, that trade-offs are real. They're not necessarily inevitable, but they're real. So choices like an ineffective, expensive, crisis-oriented medical procedures or cheap, cost-effective preventive measures, like the NICU and the vaccine example, or like many of the examples discussed here, those are real dilemmas. But once again, you know, to tie this back to Paul Slovak's talk this morning, there are studies on things like the singularity effect, that effect that he talked about where you, give, you donate more to the individual one person or the one child as opposed to a group of children that includes that same child, that too increases developmentally. When you're a little kid, you're less likely to share in general. <laughs> you do get less selfish, but you give more to more children than to fewer. You're rational in that sense, in that kind of allocation sense that we've all been talking about. As you get older, you show the singularity effect where you give more to the one child than to the, to the many. And that really should give us pause to think about, you know, why is that? And what could there be value in that perspective? So, Paul, uh, this, uh, you know, you, you've inspired me so many times in my work. And I would say that, you know, one of the implications of the curves he showed was perhaps we should be more linear with respect to the lives. Maybe, you know, we should feel worse when more people are dying, and, and perhaps that's true. But maybe we should, in fact, um, think about uh, the difference between nobody and somebody dying, the life of each individual, as the life of the many. So perhaps we're not, we're, we're too linear as opposed to not linear enough. I think Taber is a wonderful example of trying to change trade-offs rather than accept them. So we could say, we looked at the, you know, the outcomes based on the wonderful work that was shown us um, of uh, patients who would have surgery or medication, and there was a dramatic difference. So many more people die with just medication as opposed to surgery, but they couldn't have the surgery. So we can think about trading off and selection of patients and all of that, or we can innovate and develop something like taverns where we can square the circle where we don't have to accept the trade-offs because we're gonna change the reality rather than accept it. And I think there's always hope of that. So the question is, when do we trade off? And when do we resist the trade-offs? Um, and when do we have the wisdom to know the difference? And in particular, uh, just to close, um, I think valuing people's preferences, which was pointed out uh, that several people have the responsibility of doing here, to think about what people's preferences are, even when they are irrational based on our classical theories. But this has implications for ongoing trust, because if we say we value the patient's perspective, and then they say, well, except when it agrees with what we would want people to do, that's really not valuing the patient's perspective. So I would say, uh, invite you to think about whether we see th human lives from a population perspective as grains of sand, you know, small, numerous, and indistinguishable,
Or perhaps we can see in each individual the universe in a grain of sand, with apologies to William Blake.